Hi, I'm Emil Guillermo, your host of The PETA Podcast. On today's episode, following a PETA undercover investigation, the Washington Post further exposed the cruel practices of the Invigo dog breeding facility in Virginia that earned Invigo dozens of USDA citations for animal mistreatment violations. The beagles from that facility not only go to projects funded and approved by the National Institutes of Health, but also to vivisectors around the country and the world. Vivisection is a multi-billion dollar industry that relies on beagles, chimpanzees, rats, and other animals for cruel experiments in the name of science and commerce. To understand the basics of how vivisectors work, here's a reprise of an episode called Vivisection Hell on this edition of The PETA Podcast. Welcome to The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this behind-the-scenes look at PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. Here we talk to the key players at PETA and the movement and ask them about how animal rights change their lives and how they stay motivated to make the world a better place for animals. On today's episode, Vivisection Hell. You know, you have about 100,000 monkeys are in laboratories in the United States, tens of thousands of dogs and cats. They're all in stainless steel cages being used in experiments that involve pain, many of them. Monkeys are often separated from their mothers. They're infected with diseases. They go crazy from the laboratory environment because these are highly cognitively complex social animals. And now we're forcing them to live in these sterile stainless steel boxes. And, and that kind of living condition drives them to go mad. And it's, it's a horrific atrocity on the largest scale. It really is. Jeremy Beckham is a research associate for PETA's laboratory investigations. His job is exposing animal cruelty at private labs and at the research labs in America's top universities. What goes on there will make you weep. You can see all kinds of experiments and uh, pointless curiosities explored in animals. They try to model everything from child abuse uh, to substance use disorders in animals. So they'll turn monkeys into tweakers and addict them to methamphetamine, or they'll strap them into chairs and put electrodes in their brains. So, I mean, I think at some point, you know, if, if you're an animal in a laboratory, no matter what kind of laboratory it is, your life is more or less hell. And it's pretty hard to evaluate and weigh different circles of hell against one another. They're just lives of absolute deprivation and loneliness and pain, no matter how you look at it. Beckham became an animal rights activist as a teenager when he realized the cruelty of hunting and fishing. After that, he didn't just carry a sign. He did the hard work of exposing experimentation in labs like at the University of Utah, filing Freedom of Information Act requests to get documents. What he's discovered since then is how when the NIH gives money for experiments, research institutions see it as a gigantic boondoggle. Anytime the NIH hands a university experiment or a sum of money for an experiment, the university itself gets to skim about half of that grant for their facilities and administrative costs. They call these indirect costs. And those funds can, can be used for all sorts of things, like constructing new buildings on campuses to mm -hmm. offset budgetary deficits. And so there's a huge financial incentive for this practice to continue. It's not about finding cures for diseases. It's about keeping the gravy train rolling. More with Jeremy and what PETA is doing in April for World Week for Animals and Laboratories, an international week of protest starting April 23rd. But first, just want to thank you for joining us on this episode and hope you'll spread the word that our broadcast can be heard 24-7 on demand on your mobile phones and computers. Please share the link with your friends. Let them all know the animals have a voice on the PETA podcast. And now here's my conversation with PETA anti-vivisection researcher, Jeremy Beckham. Vivisection is a word you don't often hear. Though vivisection has not gone out of style, it comes from the root word sect, meaning to cut, dates back to the second century. Physicians would cut live monkeys and dogs for medical research. And to this day, 
100 million animals are still being experimented on. Jeremy talks about that number in our conversation, and we talk about that word, vivisection. You might have heard it in the Oscar-winning movie, The Shape of Water. Jeremy sure did. Have you seen the the movie uh, The Shape of Water? Yes, uh, I did see it. I liked it very much. Yeah. Now, did you catch it when they used the word vivisection in the movie? Oh, yes. I mean, whenever I see the word vivisection in in, in any movie or television show or reading, it, it, it always grabs my attention. I mean, how many times have you really heard the term vivisection in a movie? I, I think that's the first time I've ever heard it. Yeah, it definitely in a, in a recent modern movie. The funny thing about the term vivisection is I think the term used to have more popular currency than it does now. You used to see it used in major print publications. And sometimes I would even see reference to the term vivisection in really old movies, like movies from the 30s and 40s. I mean, like Frankenstein or something like that? Yeah, exactly. Actually, I think the term vivisection does appear in Frankenstein, the book, the original book, uh, Shelley's Frankenstein. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely something that's fallen out of popular usage a little bit recently, but really the term goes back quite a ways. So when you heard it on on or in The Shape of Water, you must have really been, well, I know, were you taken aback a little bit? Because I know I was kind of startled. I, I thought that was a a landmark moment in modern modern history. Yeah, I mean, I I thought it was. Uh, I mean, the whole movie, you know, had some messaging in there about how others aren't our experimental subjects to use, and so it was, you know, it was nice seeing that, and then also combining it with the term vivisection. I thought that the the message there was pretty clear, and you know, the fact that you know the movie took place, I forget exactly when it was. It was like 1950s or something like that. And, you know, it probably would have been more uh, unsurprising to hear the word vivisection back then. So in some ways, it was actually just more accurate and reflective of reality. Yeah. And yet, you know, today, people stop you probably when you mention the term vivisection. Yeah. I mean, I, I have to be honest. Now I even sort of avoid using it when I'm speaking to just the general public because people don't hear it anymore. And so they don't know what it means. I mean, if I'm having a, a longer conversation with someone, I might slip it in because people can then understand the meaning of it through context, right? But, um, mm -hmm. but you know, if I'm, if I'm only speaking with someone briefly, I'll probably use a phrase like animal testing or animal experimentation because people understand exactly what you're talking about when you use those terms. So when you think of the, the phrase anti-vivisection, which is a loaded phrase, actually six syllables, anti-experimentation is eight syllables. So, you know, <laughs> it's, a, it's a little it's shorter. But uh, right. explain what you do when, when people say, oh, yeah, you're, you're the anti-viv guy. Uh, explain what it is you do, Jeremy. Sure. Uh, so I work in PETA's laboratory investigations department. And I mean, honestly, I think I, I guess I do a little of this and a little of that. But it's all uh, with the goal of trying to end the use of animals in experimentation and shut down laboratories and replace it with the use of better alternatives that don't hurt animals and actually lead to relevant clinical discoveries. What that looks like, you know, varies a little bit based on the situation at hand. I mean, often it involves doing research on exactly what experimenters are doing to animals because, you know, they don't exactly broadcast their dirty work for the world to see. So you have to find creative ways to even learn what's happening in laboratories. And that often means things like Freedom of Information Act requests. And then once you research what's going on, the second step, of course, is doing everything in your power to try to stop it, to try to stop the cruelty. And that often involves trying to call attention to it to members of the public, uh, elected officials, anyone else with any sort of position of influence or power to try to stop it. And, and also just raising general public awareness, because there's no way we're going to end this cruelty until we get a critical mass of people to understand how wrong it is. Now, you've been doing this quite a while. I mean, you're a young guy, and yet I, I know from your background that you've been at this since you were like in high school. Is that it? Yeah. So, I mean, gosh, I mean, I first started to think about animals differently back when I was about 15 or 16 years old. Um, I used to uh, be a hunter and a shark fisherman way back then. Hmm. And I saw a television program. It was actually Bill Maher's old show, Politically Incorrect. And yeah. he had on his program Ted Nugent. And they had a debate or an argument about hunting. And I thought that even then, I thought Bill Maher had made some good points. 
that if I wouldn't shoot my dog or if we'd arrest someone for shooting my dog, why would we shoot a deer? And I had never thought about it in just even those simple terms, even though I myself had had killed animals so many times before, I had never thought about it in such starkly simple terms. And it just kind of one thing led to another. I wound up reading uh, Peter Singer's book, Animal Liberation, which truly was uh, altering the alter the trajectory of my life, I would say. And uh, went vegan at about age 16. I've never really looked back. Well, uh, And then not only did you change these things in your life, but you actually became an activist at that early age. Yeah, I mean, I think once I realized the scale of the injustice and the suffering that was going on, it was kind of impossible to go back to normal life. That's honestly how I felt. Um, I mean, <laughs> you know, you go out in public and you see billboards for meat and you see advertisements for pharmaceuticals that were tested on animals. You see people wearing leather and fur. It's just everywhere. And the reminders are inescapable. And so I feel like if, if once your eyes are opened, really the only responsible thing you can do is to try to dedicate yourself to doing everything you can to stop it. And so I started doing that, you know, right when I got involved around 16, 17. And when I started college at the University of Utah, when I was 18, 19 years old, those were kind of my first anti-vivisection campaigns back then. And what did your parents and your family and your friends think when they said, oh, you know, there's my buddy, the, the shark uh, fisherman or the shark hunter, the, the hunter. He's changed his life. What was their reaction to you? You know, I'll be totally honest with you. I, I think I probably did lose a couple friendships over it because, you know, I had some conversations with some of my buddies back then and we didn't see eye to eye. And I guess it was just sort of an irre irreconcilable difference um, at that point. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I sort of made new friends, uh, I guess you could say, you know, other people who were um, involved in the movement at the time, they kind of became my new social circle to some degree. You know, so I, I guess that was I, how I kind of moved forward with that. You became a really essentially a full fledged activist as soon as you got to college, and it's changed your life. And now you're at PETA, and now you're 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 doing the work, but also you're leading groups of activists to try to draw attention to uh, animal experimentation. And this is a key month, April. Yeah. So later this month, it's the the week of April twenty second is an annual event that uh, the movement acknowledges every year called World Week for Animals in Laboratories. During this week, activists all around the world try to call attention to the plight of animals who are used in experimentation. How did it start? I mean, how did, did a, it's not a PETA event necessarily. But... Just sort of grew as, as a grassroots kind of thing. In the late 90s especially, there were huge protests outside laboratories, and people even did things like lockdowns, you know, where they would commit acts of civil disobedience to try to call attention to the animals imprisoned inside these laboratories. And it's it's not any one group or any one organization. It's international in scope. And it's just one week that people try to set some time aside to focus on the use of animals in laboratories, because there's already, I think, quite a lot of attention on, you know, raising and killing animals for food and veganism. And there's been some wonderful victories on the skins front as well with San Francisco banning fur, that it can be easy for people to forget that 100 million animals in just in the United States um, are used in laboratory experiments every single year. You know, it's, it's, it's a very secretive and too often forgotten abuse of animals. And so I think it's good to have this week every year to, to remind people that this is still happening. And when you, you talk about that, that number, 100 million? Yeah, that's right. I mean, those are just our best estimates. To be totally honest with you, no one knows exactly how many animals are used in experimentation because about 95% of the animals used in laboratories, these are rats, mice, and birds, they're not even considered animals under the hmm. federal law that uh, regulates this activity. So since they're not considered animals, no one bothers counting all of them laboratories that only use rats and mice don't even have to register and we don't even really know that they exist um and so you know researchers have tried to make varying estimates but those are some of the best estimates that we have that about 100 million animals 95 percent of which are rats mice and birds are used and killed in u.s laboratories every year and are these corporate labs academic labs or are all the labs sort of you know I mean, are, is there a difference between the 
academic or the research facilities at universities and say the more corporate type of labs? There are big differences between these types of laboratory facilities. I think that you could, in a general sense, break down the types of laboratories into three categories, I would say. Um, one would be corporate laboratories. These are often affiliated with a pharmaceutical company or what's called a CRO, a contract research organization. These are private companies that are basically a laboratory for hire. You know, their whole reason for existing is just profit just like any private company, really. So that's one type of company or one type of laboratory. A second type would be what's often affiliated with what's called basic research. And basic research is basically research pursued for the purpose of exploring some academic curiosity or for publishing papers. And those laboratories are affiliated with research universities all around the country. Every major research university in the United States has an animal laboratory affiliated with it. And then I would say the third type of laboratory that you see in the United States would be government um, facilities. And these are things like the Meat Animal Research Center in Nebraska that the New York Times exposed a couple of years ago, as well as Department of Defense and VA laboratories peppered around the country. And, and they're all bad? Are they all equally bad? Or are, are, are some worse than others? Or... How do you? How would you break down the most, uh, uh, you know, the the most uh, egregious? I would say that they're all equally but differently bad. Um, so I mean, you know, in a Department of Defense animal laboratory, you have, for example, sometimes monkeys being used in experiments where they're going to be exposed to some toxin that's in nerve gas um, to simulate a chemical weapons attack, and obviously that's just hideous in its own way. But in, in a research university, you can see all kinds of experiments and uh, pointless curiosities explored in animals. They try to model everything from child abuse uh, to substance use disorders in animals. So they'll turn monkeys into tweakers and addict them to, me addict them to methamphetamine, or they'll strap them into chairs and put electrodes in their brains. So, I mean, I think at some point, you know, if, if you're an animal in a laboratory, no matter what kind of laboratory it is, um, your life is more or less hell, and it's pretty hard to evaluate and weigh different circles of hell against one another. I mean, they're, they're just lives of absolute deprivation and loneliness and pain, no matter how you look at it. But some of the causes and uh, structural features of these different laboratories might be different in relevant ways, especially when we try to stop it. You know, we'll pursue different lines of attack if it's a university laboratory versus if it's a private corporate laboratory, if that makes sense. But from the animal's perspective, I think it barely makes a difference. But the private corporate labs might be a little harder to, to, to get at since they're, they're private, they're, they're mm -hmm. privately funded, they're not publicly funded. Some people would say, aren't some of these experiments necessary, either for compliance reasons or because they do something that might might help uh, advance. We're, we're searching for a cure. We're searching for some kind of answer. Is that a justification? Well, okay. So there, I would say there's a few things to unpack there in what you just said. Um, the first is the issue of, you know, a private company it can be harder to find out what's going on. And that's certainly true because you can't submit, you know, a Freedom of Information Act request to a private company and have it fulfilled. So in that sense, those it's it's harder to make progress there. But the flip side of that is sometimes private companies are more susceptible, I would argue, to different kinds of market pressures. So mm -hmm. you had, for example, earlier this year, there was a, a pretty big scandal about how Volkswagen was carrying out these awful inhalation toxicity experiments on monkeys using a laboratory in New Mexico. And when this hit the press, Volkswagen tried to uh, you know, immediately go into damage control and say, we're, re we're looking at how this happened to make sure this abuse never happened again. And the reason that they so quickly went into damage control is Volkswagen understands that their image matters because consumers are purchasing their cars. And that's sort of different than when you have, for example, a university institution where all of this funding basically comes from federal tax dollars. And so although it can be easier to learn about what's happening, I would argue that in some ways, public opinion 
doesn't make as much of an immediate impact on it because they're, they're sort of insulated from what public opinion thinks because they can just keep getting funding from tax money. Um, right. So, so, so there, there, there's, there's some, you know, there, there's some advantages and some disadvantages strategically for going after one or the other. Um, with respect to, you know, these claims that, you know, using animals in experiments are going to find cures for diseases. My experience in working on this issue for 15 years is sort of that the check's always in the mail, so to speak, with that. Mm-hmm. You know, they're always saying that we're, there's going to be a cure right around the corner, and these cures really don't ever pan out. And what you wind up with, for example, at Texas A&M University, as well as a few other universities around the world, they're breeding dogs intentionally to display a condition that mimics the symptoms of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And they've been doing this now for 35 years without developing any kind of therapy. But now that we're targeting them, you see Texas A&M University and some of the other private companies behind this, you know, they were trying to tout a clinical trial that was starting earlier this year. And now that clinical trial has been halted by the FDA because of severe adverse effects in the human volunteers that were enrolled in it. So, but, but until that clinical hold happened, they were saying the cure is right around the corner. We're already in phase one, phase two trials. And, and the reality is that that's not an unusual case. 92% of drugs that appear safe and efficacious in animals go on to fail in humans in clinical trials because drugs don't react the same way in animals that they do in humans. So a lot of these claims are, the, are, are really about them circling their wagons and trying to defend their practice, but I don't think the evidence actually really substantiates this. Well, you just said something there. 92% of the claims don't pan out when mm-hmm. applied to humans, which suggests an overwhelming uh, amount of evidence uh, that the experiments on animals are are fruitless, useless. Oh, I think that's completely clear. I mean, especially in the year 2018, when we've developed all of these new technologies like organ on a chip, new advanced computing technology to do uh, structural analysis of chemicals to predict their toxicity that way or drug efficacy that way. And, you know, I think that there might have been a scientific case for using animals to model humans a hundred years ago or, or even longer ago when our understanding of human biology and anatomy was so rudimentary, right? Like you can cut up any mammal, a rat, a dog, a horse, a human, whatever, and you're going to see a four chambered heart. And so in that sense, you know, one animal can model another animal. But when you start to ask questions about a biological system, that is looking at genetic and molecular levels of analysis and interactions and gene interactions, things like that, which, which are all the questions we're asking now, by the way, in biomedical science. It's all on genetic and molecular level. And it's precisely on that level that a mouse becomes a mouse and a human becomes a human. And so the model starts to break down when you look at those specific types of biological questions, which are all of the important ones now. And that's why increasingly the animal models are failing. And yet people, when they hear about experiments, while they may not like to understand the grisly details of what goes on and the lives of the animals, a part of them, a part of the public wants to accept that maybe they're, the experimenters are doing this as a kind of last resort, that maybe there's no other way to find a cure for a disease. Is that the case or is that just some kind of a rationale for experiments? I think that if you look at the experimenter's own words when they're speaking, when they think no one is looking, you'll find many cases where the truth comes out and that it's not really about this is a last resort and this is the only way we're going to answer fundamentally important questions. What it's really about is frankly money. And these experiments all have enormous sums of grant money attached to them. And for every single grant that's awarded to a university, this is a fact that I think shocks a lot of people. Anytime the NIH hands a university experiment or a sum of money for an experiment, the university itself gets to skim about half of that grant for their facilities and administrative costs. They call these indirect costs. 
And those funds can, can be used for all sorts of things, like constructing new buildings on campuses to mm -hmm. offset budgetary deficits. And so there's a huge financial incentive for this practice to continue. It's not about finding cures for diseases. It's about keeping the gravy train rolling. And, you know, one example I like to point out a lot was PETA had a successful campaign against um, a UW, University of Wisconsin cat experiment that was happening. It was a terrible experiment that happened for more than 30 years where cats were intentionally deafened. They had electrodes implanted in their brains, metal coils implanted around their eyes, mm. and they were restrained in a bag and forced to stare at a screen. And it was absolutely horrific experiments. But one of the most notable things about it was in his written animal use protocol that the experimenter submitted to the committee to get approval for the experiment, under the field that says justification for animal use, so this is how he was justifying this torturous experiment, he said that his experience has shown that they can use up to 30 cats per year in this experiment because it allows them to keep up a productive publication record to secure more grant funding. So the funding itself and the publications themselves become the reason for existing for these studies. It's a very perverse system. And I think when people really look under the hood, and see how this all works and look past the spin and look past the university communications departments that are putting out endless press releases, selling false hope to people. I think then their eyes kind of get open to how <laughs> what this whole system is yeah. about. And that's money. Well, it's also you've got 30 years of experiments. And how does that stack up with results? I mean, you probably have more subsidized university buildings and labs and, you know, other, mm -hmm. other things that uh, the university uh, uses to offset deficits from this public money. But you probably don't see very many cures or very many scientific results that get us closer to a solution to the problem they're trying to solve. Right. I mean, that's absolutely correct. But see, when their communications department are trying to justify the experimentation and the cruelty to the public, they'll say we're trying to cure diseases. But if you look sort of more behind the scenes, you know, what they're actually writing in their animal use protocols, they're justifying the existence of the experiments on the funding and on the publications. And there's no question that you can devise infinite numbers of animal experiments that will get you published in journals. There's so many different journals out there. And you can design whatever experiment you want to generate data and then publish a paper based off that. It doesn't mean that that data or that paper is going to lead to anything meaningful in the clinic for humans, but it can be a, a, an easy driver of tenure and academic, you know, to demonstrate that you're doing something with your academic career, all of that. And if that becomes the ultimate goal, well, sure, they're succeeding there. They're getting grant funding, they're publishing papers. And that's really what is the engine driving all of this, not cures for human diseases. That's just the after-the-fact justification that they put on when the public starts to scrutinize what they're doing. And of course, uh, while all this happens, millions of animals end up tortured and, and end up dying. Exactly. I mean, you know, you have about 100,000 monkeys are in laboratories in the United States, tens of thousands of dogs and cats. They're all in stainless steel cages being used in experiments that involve pain, many of them. Monkeys are often separated from their mothers. They're infected with diseases. They go crazy from the laboratory environment because these are highly cognitively complex social animals. And now we're forcing them to live in these sterile stainless steel boxes. And, and that kind of living condition drives them to go mad. And it's, it's a horrific atrocity on the largest scale. It really is. And it's not even just for the animals. We also have to talk about all of the wasted money here. Hundreds of millions of dollars at some of these universities are funneled into animal experiments that might publish a lot of papers, but don't help people who actually are suffering from disease. And every single time the federal government awards a, a grant for an animal experimenter, that's an opportunity cost. That's a lost opportunity for funding other more beneficial projects that actually could help people. And that's another travesty in all of this. We talked about your origins as a, growing up in Utah and then going to the University of Utah and then discovering your activism there. Tell us about your experience mm -hmm. with the University of Utah and the kind of experiments they do that are particularly uh, 
troubling. I guess I'll, I'll kind of start towards the beginning because I think it was a little formative. But, you know, when I was 19 years old, I used Utah's state open records law. It's called GRAMA. It's like our state equivalent of FOIA. And I wanted to know, I was a student at the university at the time, and I wanted to know more about the primate experiments that were going on on campus. At the time, we had about 30 or 40 monkeys in our laboratory on campus. So I asked for the protocols. This is the written description of what they want to do to these monkeys. And the university denied me, claiming that it was proprietary, uh, denied my request. And so I appealed it, and it went in front of a state records committee uh, to decide whether or not the public had a right to know what they were doing with our money at a public university to monkeys. And I think there's a fundamental right there that all taxpayers have to know how our money is being used, most especially to public institution, um, on animal experiments. And, you know, I was only 19 years old, and I had this hearing in front of this committee, and I wound up winning it. And it was in the local press a little bit. And it kind of made me, the whole experience made me realize, you know, it was an emperor has no clothes kind of moment. Because they put forward all of these justifications that the protocol was proprietary or that there would be security risks if it were released. But when a neutral third party actually looked at it, they said, no, these arguments don't hold water and the public has a right to know what's going on. And to this day, you can still get at least redacted protocols because of that case. But it was a very empowering experience. It showed that, you know, really and truly, sometimes you can fight the system and win. Well, yeah, and you can still do it to this day, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, and, and, and lots of the battles that we fight, you know, as animal advocates working on this issue, I think, are battles for transparency, just to get the public the right to know what's happening inside these laboratories, often with our tax money. I, I think that the whole field of animal experimentation really cannot survive public scrutiny. And I think that they know that. I think that once people actually see images or video, most especially, of what's happening to these animals in laboratories, or even just written descriptions and understand how often rules are broken and laws are violated and the waste of money, once people really understand how this whole system works, they turn against it. And that's why you're seeing that change in public opinion polls. Where is it now? Yeah, it's about half of Americans now say they oppose the use of animals in any experimentation, period. And by the way, in my opinion, the Gallup poll that asked this question, even is sort of uh, the way it's worded is a bit leading. You know, it says, do you oppose the use of animals in research for medical benefit? It says something like that. So it implies that these experiments do have a medical benefit when they don't. But even when presented with a loaded question like that, half of Americans say that they oppose the use of animals in experimentation. So it's a coin flip. It's a coin flip. And, and the other thing that's very hopeful is that trend line is going in our direction. So the same poll seven or eight years ago, the number was more like 35%. Um, so yeah. increasing numbers of Americans are turning against this practice and younger Americans as well. So the next generation is starting to wise up to this and realize that this, this whole enterprise of using animals as ex you know, experimental models for hum humans it's all a house of cards and it's all nonsense and it's all built on the suffering of animals and they're turning against it. Um, so I think that those are all reasons for optimism. And so when you stopped or when you won that, uh, that case to get transparency, that first case at the University of Utah, did, were you able to stop the experiment? Well, one of the experimenters that in, was involved in that issue retired a little while later. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to know. Uh, whether or not your efforts to <laughs> sign, shine some light on what they're doing may have hastened a retirement, right? I think that that's often the situation that animal advocates are in. Um, but I definitely think that the media discussion around the whole case kept the issue in, in, in the forefront of people's minds. And uh, it, it also was just a demonstration to people that ordinary people and students really do have power if they want to take on these kinds of structures, they can make a difference. Okay, so we talk about getting at the transparency, getting at the protocols describing these experiments. Now, I've heard experimenters in universities say that the labs have very strict oversight, animals are protected, and are living pretty good lives. I mean, you've described that not to be the case. What is the truth? 
Well, the first thing I would say to that is in about 30 or 40 states in the United States, there is written into the state cruelty to animals law a specific exemption for animals used in laboratory experiments. Okay, so let me repeat that. <laughs> Acts that would normally be cruelty to animals if carried out outside a laboratory, these are acts that would get you arrested and probably thrown in jail. They're perfectly legal and allowable if done inside the walls of a laboratory facility. Well, what gives them that immunity? What? It's written right into the law. So the legislators have actually, in these states, have carved out an exemption where they have said laboratories are a no-holds-barred zone. Anything goes. There's no such thing as cruelty to animals if it's inside a laboratory. And the University of Wisconsin, for example, lobbied for that exemption in the state of Wisconsin just a few years ago and got it. So these laboratories are actively lobbying for these exemptions. And sadly, they're getting it in many cases. And so if what they're doing was so humane and the animals were protected and not suffering, why would they need these exemptions? I mean, that should raise a red flag immediately. And <laughs> the, the, the simple answer is because what they're doing is cruelty to animals. And it would constitute a violation of the law if it weren't for that, because they're intentionally breaking animals' bones. They're intentionally drilling into their skulls. They're depriving them of food and water in many of these cases. They're delivering electric shocks to the animals. They're intentionally inflicting psychological distress in cases. And so all of these things are meet any reasonable definition of cruelty to animals. And all of these things passed their oversight committee, uh, which really is more of a rubber stamp committee. Um, so I think that the plain evidence contradicts their defense that animals are protected in laboratories. And so what is PETA and, and others, what are they doing to try to reverse the laws? Uh, you, we talked about transparency earlier, but what is, uh, what is PETA, PETA doing to try to stop all this? PETA is pursuing what I guess I would call an every tool in the box strategy uh, to try to end the use of animals in experiments. And to some degree, it's a case by case thing. And different, different situations call for different approaches. So, for example, one thing that we discovered in our work over the decades is that, unfortunately, a lot of animal experiments continue because of some archaic regulation that requires it. And these are often EPA or FDA regulations that actually require the manufacturer of, say, a pesticide or some other chemical. They actually have to test the product on animals before they can market it. And so we have a whole division at PETA called the Regulatory Testing Division that is dedicated towards trying to work with regulators so that they accept non-animal valid research methods for this kind of data. Because a, a, a public pressure campaign is probably going to have very limited effectiveness against a private party that is being legally forced to test on animals. So the only responsible approach there is to change that dynamic so there's no longer that legal requirement. Okay. And so they have, they have victories all the time, regulatory testing division. Some of these victories save thousands or even millions of animals, believe it or not, just by changing one little regulation to say, okay, no, you can use in vitro or computer model data. We don't necessarily need you to test on dogs or rats. And they had, you know, just to take one example, um, in Canada, there was a legal requirement still in place up until 2016. They said you had to test any new pesticide on dogs, and they were commonly using beagles for this. And other countries had already accepted non-animal data for this exact same uh, test. Um, the EU accepted non-animal data, for example, and the regulatory testing division was able to persuade the Canadian authorities to get on board with that program and no longer require the dog test. So that might be a case where, you know, meetings and conversations with regulators can help secure a victory for animals. But there are other cases, frankly, where you just need old school traditional pressure brought to bear, right? Mm -hmm. So you have, for example, this one of our big campaigns right now, and I think you've interviewed one of my colleagues already a little bit about this, but we have a big campaign right now against Texas A&M University because right. they're still carrying out these horrific experiments on dogs that are being intentionally bred to have muscular dystrophy. And I encourage everyone listening to go to PETA.org and take a look at the footage we have of these dogs drooling, limping, um, obviously living just absolutely horrid lives. 
at Texas A&M University. This laboratory, not required by any law, this is an elective abuse of animals. And I think the only way to get them to stop doing that, frankly, is by increasing the pressure and shame on them for doing that. So PETA and also our supporters show up at, you name it, sporting events that Texas A&M's putting on, commencements, speaking engagements, all of these things to try to embarrass their uh, administrators and leaders into doing the right thing. Because if their name gets tarnished enough and they start to lose donors, they start to lose alumni support, they start to get trashed in the press, all of those things will wear them down. And, you know, we've seen that formula work in other cases as well. The NIH stopped torturing baby monkeys uh, after we had a pressure campaign on them. The University of Wisconsin ended its cat experiment after an um, enormous amount of pressure. So sometimes that's that's the key to success is just raw public pressure. So, you know, it, 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 it all it's all different depending on the situation we're confronted with. And so what are PETA's plans for World Week of Animals and Laboratories? It's coming up on uh, the week of April 23rd. It's a big week. It's worldwide. How is PETA planning to make a splash? So I would encourage everyone listening, if they want to get involved in any of PETA's campaigns, whether they're animal testing or not, to go on our website and sign up for our action team. And we'll take your information based on, for example, where you live. And you'll get notified if there's a protest or a demonstration or some other event happening in your area. And for people who want to know specifically what's happening in their area, they should do that because I can't, on this phone call, say what's happening in all 50 states. But generally speaking, we're going to be doing protests outside facilities that have these muscular dystrophy dog colonies because there's a few of them around the country. And our action team is helping coordinate that. But even if you don't live in one of those locations that's having one of these protests, we're going to be having other events that anyone can participate in, no matter where you are, like call-in days. You know, these are days where hundreds or thousands of our supporters just pick up the phone and make a call to an influential person, maybe at Texas A&M University, maybe at the NIH, whatever the target is, and urges them to do the right thing. And, you know, if they get hundreds or thousands of calls and their lines are tied up, that's something that'll grab their attention, especially if it's done repeatedly. I, you know, I, I find that often one of the most successful predictors of a campaign is whether or not you have the endurance to keep the pressure going and just wear them down day by day, week by week, month by month. And, you know, you don't know which grain of sand <laughs> is the one that tips them over, but eventually all of this pressure will build up and, and we will see victories for animals. So the, the best thing I would recommend for people to do to help get involved in World League for Animals and Labs would be to go to our website, type in their email and their contact information and sign up for our action team. And you can speak from experience, not just as a PETA person, but as a young kid in, in high school and, you know, freshman year in, in college uh, when you became an activist and started uh, uh, speaking out. It works, right? It does work, but we shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking it's easy. You know, there are a lot of frustrations and disappointments along the way. You're going to be dealt setbacks from time to time. Uh, but, you know, you have to keep pushing forward um, because the only other alternative is to go down some sort of downward spiral of despair and hopelessness <laughs> is the way I view it. <laughs> um, but, you know, if, if if we keep pushing ahead, you really can make some differences. Well, let me ask you this, Jeremy. You've been at it a while now. And you're how old now? 32. So, all right. So when you started this this whole journey toward, uh, mm -hmm. you know, away from hunting, away from shark hunting and, and moving toward a, a this compassionate life, uh, there have been ups and downs and there's still a lot more fight left to do. How do you stay motivated? The, the alternative just seems so much worse to me is the honest truth. I mean, the alternative would be to withdraw and become some sort of consummate cynic, self-centered person. Um, and it doesn't even seem like something that's possible, given the knowledge of what's happening. Um, so, I mean, I, I <laughs> it, that's a hard one. I, I, I don't know how to answer that one, Emil, directly, uh, other than just to say, you know, I, 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 it, it's just a, a, an inner sense of moral obligation, I guess. You know, when you see others in need of help, you should try to come to their aid. And, you know, whether that's an individual you see you know, in front of you with an injury or a whole system that's hurting others, 
we all have an obligation to speak up and try to stop it. And sometimes we're successful. And I think that that's one thing that can help keep you going. Five years ago here in Salt Lake City, we had a big campaign, all the activist community here and PETA, to stop the horse-drawn carriages in Salt Lake. We used to have horse-drawn carriages operate on our streets. And the city has now banned them. And that was a direct result of our efforts, to be honest. And so things like that can definitely keep you going. When you realize, if it weren't for me and if it weren't for other people joining this fight like me, those horses would still be breathing in car exhaust in the streets of Salt Lake City. There's no doubt about that. Or the monkeys that Steve Swoomey was experimenting on, the baby monkeys at the NIH, they would still be getting ripped away from their mothers and abused in those psychological experiments if PETA had not intervened. And so I think it's it's those victories that can help provide some motivation to keep going. But it's also just the recognition of, of how much work there is left to do as well. Well, there's still 100 million animals to save, right? That's right. And, and that's and that's just the animals in laboratories, right? I mean, there's animals suffering on, on fur farms and pig farms and in rodeos and in circuses. You know, we, we, we view animals as though they're just things um, and resources for us to use. And our whole paradigm needs to change. And bit by bit, I think we're chipping away at it, at this front and that. And, and, and times are slowly changing. It can be hard to see change unfolding before your eyes and realize it. But I do think things are changing. And there's little signs of it here and there, if you're looking. Jeremy, I really appreciate your time and your uh, your perspective well thank you for having me it was wonderful jeremy beckham PETA anti-vivisection researcher go to PETA.org and find out more about how you can take action on world week for animals and laboratories coming up on april 23rd and that's our show for today hey you can contact us at PETA.org. find me on twitter at amilamuck once again thank you for listening Don't forget to go to iTunes and rate and review the show. It'll help us reach more people and let them know why it's important to speak out and take action for the animals. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. Join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on the PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo.